Thanks for joining us today at Harvest Christian Church. We pray the message is a blessing to you as you're going through whatever you are going through. I do encourage you to download our app or check out our website, harvestchristian.church. On that website, you can watch our messages. While you're watching the messages, send some comments or prayer requests. We'd love to pray for you. And you can also give online if you would like to bless this ministry as it's blessing you in return. I want you to know that you matter and you're valuable to God and to us at Harvest Christian Church. Have a great day. We're in the book of Acts, and as we left off last week, I want to start off with this way. It was by, the, by A.D. 325, it's 325 years after Jesus' death, Christianity had spread like crazy. I mean, it was no, there was no way to even know how it was going to spread or how big it was going to become. Did you know scholars believe and scholars say that over half of the Roman Empire had become Christian by 325 A.D.? Over half of the Roman Empire became the, the world power at the time. And it all started. How did it start? 11 guys. One of them gave up on life. 11 guys on a hillside. No power. No platform. No real earthly prestige or authority. No money. No endowment. No celebrity status. They just had been with Jesus, the Bible tells us. And they had an absolute conviction in their hearts that, that Jesus not only came to earth, was God's son, lived a perfect life, died, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, but they believed he was the Savior, the Messiah that God had sent. And then they had this strange power that came into them called the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that is what enabled them to go in. Eleven men changed one of the most pagan societies the world has ever known. 11 men. Let's look at this real quick. As Paul is doing his journey here, we see this, and this is Jerusalem, and he goes up in all this area, and we get over here, and we can tell, and then we're getting to Corinth and stuff like that. We're getting into, into um, Europe over here, right? And as you think of the um, Roman Empire, it came up, this Mediterranean Sea, it came up like a big reverse sea, like this, okay? There was all the Roman Empire around this, okay? So this is how it started. This, all these orange dots is where, they, where, they, where the gospel had gone to as we're right now, okay? As we're talking right now in the scripture. But by 325, actually maybe 350 um, AD, it looked like this. Okay, this is the Mediterranean Sea, but all of this, a little bit lighter blue, which is a different color, coming all around, is what they said had become Christian. By 325 AD, it had spread like wildfire. And, and what's, what's the key to a gospel spreading and for people to knowing the gospel was real? The key was that every person, everyone say every person, that every person, not just a handful of, 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 of specialized apostles, not just a hand, handful of specialized disciples, every person carried the gospel message with them wherever they went. You pull me down just a tad bit in the room. It's just ringing just a little bit. Every person carried that message. But what does evangelism by normal people look like? How can we have this happen in our world? Now, the word evangelism is a Christian word. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big word that simply means sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. Proclaiming with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's evangelism. Acts chapter 16 gives us a picture of what ordinary evangelism looks like. And now, here's the funny thing. As soon as I start preaching about evangelism or subjects like this, I always feel like those that aren't Christians and you know, online or here, wherever it is, are probably saying, oh, great, here it is. Now all they're going to do is they're going to talk about how they're going to try to convert me. He's going to try to push this Jesus on me, and I'm going to say to that, well, yes. Yes. But I want you to think of it from a Christian perspective for a second. If we as Christians really believe that Jesus is the Son of God that came from heaven down to earth, lived a perfect life, lived the life for us, he died for us, he was buried, he resurrected, ascended into heaven, and through his blood, through his sacrifice, we now have grace that we can be saved forever, and there's no way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. If we truly believe that, how could we not tell you? 
And what kind of people would we be if we did not open our mouths about such things? People have used the example often, if, if you had the cure to cancer and kept it for yourself, what would the world think? Well, that's a good analogy, but that's a tor- terrible, terrible analogy too. Because cancer will take our earthly body, but what we're talking about takes your eternity. We have the gospel message inside of our hearts. And if it's true, how can we not tell every person we see without any, any caution at all, no matter what, wherever God has us in this world, as soon as we plant our feet and we look at somebody and we have any type of right to say, hi, how's your family in their life? We say, hi, how's your family? Have you heard about Jesus Christ? And we're not trying to push it on you. We're trying to respect you and give you space. But if we didn't really want you to know this, if we didn't tell you about Jesus every other sentence in our life, would we really believe the message is true? How can we stay silent? And why, church? Why Christians? Why are we so ashamed? Why are we so scared that people might reject us And the fear we should have in our heart is that they are rejecting God without us speaking. We're going to observe three gospel conversations with three persons of interest through this. We're going to back up to what we talked about last week because it's part of the story too, and I want to hit it really quick. The first thing is chapter 16, 13, and 14. On the Sabbath day, we, as Paul and Silas, and then also we, Timothy and Luke, they went down outside, went outside the city gate by the river where we thought there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thatra, um, who worshiped God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart. Everyone say, the Lord opened her heart. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what Paul, to what was spoken by Paul. And so last week, we learned of this first conversion we see, and that's the conversion, the gospel conversion of Lydia. We looked at this last week. Who was Lydia? Well, she was this wealthy businesswoman. Um, Think about her being, she's very put together. She's very driven. She was brilliant. She was well-known. She was well-respected. And she had a lot of money. And yet, at the same time, she had some sort of religious background. She believed in God. She had not understood who Jesus was yet, but she had an understanding of God. And so she's at this prayer meeting, just trying to seek out, seek out what Christianity is, what God is. But she's not a Christ follower yet. And so how does Lydia get saved? Paul engages her with his words. Faith comes through hearing. And the only way you can hear is if somebody speaks. We talk all the time, like, I'm going to show Jesus by the way I act. That's great, but faith doesn't come through the way you act. Faith comes through you opening your mouth. So if you're only waiting for people to see your actions and trusting God, you're missing the boat. We need to open our mouths. And so Paul comes and he talks to her. He, 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 he t- comes and shares with her. She, he engages her. And essentially, it's an evangelistic Bible study that happens. And while he is speaking to her, God opens Lydia's heart. Verse 15, after she and her household were baptized, she urged us, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So his first conversion we see is Lydia. Lydia is this this highly um, successful woman, businesswoman, world traveler, has has businesses probably many places. She sells all this stuff, and she's very well respected. She probably has servants to travel with her as she goes all these places. She's having this time of prayer. She hears the gospel message. She turns her life to Jesus Christ. So the first conversion was Lydia. The second conversion we see is in chapter 16, verse 16. Once as we were on our way to prayer, again, they're on their way to prayer again, a slave girl met us. Well, that's an interesting term for a girl. But listen, not not even there. Who had a spirit of prediction. She was able to predict things of the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune telling. As you can imagine, if if you can fortune tell, they'd make a lot of money even today. We love that kind of stuff in our society. This girl is the opposite of Lydia. Scholars say she is probably in her mid-teens. She has a demon. And not only is she a slave because of a demon, but she is a, also a slave. She is owned. Which she is a, means she is spiritually 
and economically captive. She's busted up. She's continually taken advantage of. She has no worth except for what she brings to the table. And if that, that, that's, not, that's not there any longer, then she is considered garbage, as we soon find out. She's not on her way to the prayer meeting that Paul's on his way to, okay? Right? The, the demon-possessed little girl is, is not on the way to the prayer meeting. She couldn't go if she wanted to. First of all, she's a slave, and slaves wouldn't have been welcome there. Secondly, she has a demon. I'm not sure if that's welcome at prayer meetings at that day and age. Um, I'm not sure how we would accept it even today. But she has no interest in going. Look at verse 17. Um, sorry, the possessed girl there. Verse 17, as she followed Paul and us, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the slaves, interesting term, of the most high God. So she's following after, following after Paul and you're like, hey, see this guy? See this guy? He's the slave of the most high God. Now remember, this is the girl that can see into the future. She can predict things. You would think this would be a good thing. And she just goes around and she says that all the time. These are the slaves of the most high God. Oh, these are the slaves of the most high God. And so in her, in her, in her walk with in life, there's this part of her as being demon-possessed that she's attracted to faith. She's attracted to it. But at the same time, on the other side of her face, she's agnostic toward it, towards it. You know, there's a lot of people in our society that are just like that, aren't there? There are a lot of people in, this type of, in these types of captivity. There's something about the message and the gospel that attracts them, that draws them in, like, I want to be accepted and loved by that. But then they have anger and mistrust and agnostic against it because they don't want to surrender their life to that. Look at verse 18. And she did this for many days. But Paul was greatly aggravated and turning to the spirit said, I command you in the name of Christ Jesus to come out of her. And it came out right away. I love this passage right here. And the reason why it lets me know that the Bible is not made up. Bible, the, Paul doesn't stop and say, and Paul, full of compassion, said, oh, daughter of Eve, I have mercy on you. No, it says, you're annoying me, right? That's what it says. Stop annoying me. Satan, get out of her. This is, this is annoying. I love that about it because, I mean, there's, there's annoying people in my life, you know? You ever have, you have, don't raise your hand. Okay, all right. So how, how does this, how does this um, slave girl, how does this demon-possessed girl get saved? Paul performs an act of deliverance on her. He throws out the demon, which also remo removes her as a circus act for her masters. She was just being, gaining money for the people that owned her. So the second conversion is this possessed little girl. So we have Lydia, and then when her owners saw this, that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Why'd they bring them there? Not because of preaching the gospel, because they lost their prophet. Verse 20, bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, hey, these men are, ser these men are seriously disturbing our city, and they are Jews, ooh, right? Verse 21, and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adapt or to practice. Then the mob joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had inflicted many blows, what that means is there was a number of blows that was um, legal. And whenever it says many blows, what that meant is they get to the, about the thing like, oh, we forgot, let's start over again. It was the illegal amount of blows. Inflicted many blows, they threw them in jail, ordering that the jailer keep them securely guarded. Receiving such an order, he, the jailer, put them in the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. So first we learned, about, we learned about Lydia, the conversion. Then we see the possessed girl, the conversion of her. And now we see this Philippian jailer, this jailer. Who is the jailer? Now, now the jailers um, at that time, this was like a, actually a pretty prestigious position because what had happened after you had lived and lived in, um, um, been a successful, highly decorated Roman soldier, many times as your retirement gift, you got to be able to oversee, oversee the jails. Okay, you just got to oversee all the jails. And so it was a way for you to have a job and you had to go out and do all the, all the other stuff. You just oversaw those who were in prison. So this jailer was an older man. 
He had been a Roman citizen and, and taken over the world with the Romans. He was probably hardened. He was part of the ruling class of society. I'm sure he was cynical. And as he takes Paul and Silas, he, he takes them and puts them into the inner prison, it says. Now, we think inner prison like all the way there so where everything's guarded and you have to get all through stuff. Well, the inner prison back in those days would be the lowest part of the building. Um, it was a disgusting part of the building. It's where all the fecal matter would run down and settle at. It was dark, it was damp, and it was disgusting. And it says that put, they put them in stocks. And we, and we think of stocks like um, we see like the cartoons or other, other, um, bit, uh, other things of history where they just put like stocks around their feet with chains and you sat there on the ground. That's not the stocks. That's not Roman stocks. Roman stocks were chains that were suspended from the ceiling and they'd lay you on your back and then they, they, they would hook your ankles into the, into the clamps and pull you up where your, your shoulders many times were laying on the ground, but you would be hanging upside down with your feet in the air. And as they walk by and see you, they bring rods and they strike you on the bottom of the feet with the rods. It's unbelievably painful. This is what Paul and Silas are going through right now. Sometimes we jump to the end of the story and don't realize what happened. They've just been beaten in an illegal way to the point where they probably are unrecognizable and could have died. Thrown into the most disgusting place with open wounds hanging upside down and people striking them. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What were they doing? Praying and they were, they were singing to God. And the prisoners were doing what? Say the prisoners were listening with me. The prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26, suddenly, just like God does, suddenly, when you don't expect it, no one expected it, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. And you think right now, yes, Paul and Silas are free. But look what happens here in 27. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped because if he didn't kill himself, the Romans were going to do awful things to him and torture him until he died. That's the state of the jailer. The man that had just beaten, the, bad head, the man who had cruelly treated Paul and Silas, the man who had mocked them, thrown them into the most disgusting place. This is his state right now. And look what happens in verse 28. But Paul, why is he there? The chains are gone. The doors are open. Why is he there? But Paul called out in a loud voice, don't harm yourself because all of us are here. Church, why is he there? Who, who in their right mind would still be there? Paul is completely innocent. He knows that. He knows he shouldn't be in prison. He's been praying. He's been praising God. He has a work to do. The walls are down. The chains are off. The doors are open. Wouldn't this be an act of God? Like, woohoo, I'm, I'm Scott Free. Get out of here, right? Hadn't this just happened to Peter in Acts chapter 12? And Peter just walked out? remember, and got away. But Paul recognizes something, and it's something that's going to be hard for us to recognize today, but I beg you to try to. Paul recognizes that everything he went through was part of the plan of God to reach the people of Philippi. Hadn't Paul prayed that God would use him to reach the people of Philippi? then who is Paul to say how? And who are we, church? Who are we to say when, when, when conflict comes in our life, when despair comes in our life, when loss comes in our life, when injustice comes in our life, who are we to say, I don't deserve this? Who are we 
if God's if part of God's plan to reach Philippi was to put Paul in prison so that he could suffer before a Philippian jailer and then given the opportunity to reason with him to the point where the man would give his life to Jesus Christ. Paul said, so be it. It's worth it. Paul stands there with his freedom in his right hand, a freedom that is his. He was, he was not wrong. A freedom he technically deserved in that world. But that wasn't the only hand he had, was it? He had a left hand, and on the left hand was a cruel man, a hardened man, a man who had mocked him and tortured him all night long. And instead of turning to the freedom, Paul turns to the jailer. Look at verse 29. Then the jailer called for the lights. He rushed in. And he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he escorted them out and said, Sirs, tell me about Jesus. What do I have to have? What do I need to do to have what you have? I've never seen this before. Verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus. He'll save you too, Philippian jailer. And not just you, but you and your whole household. I, I noticed something really peculiar today. Maybe, maybe you guys didn't notice it, but I noticed it. As you guys walked in here and you, 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 you came up here and you came up to these things called chairs, you just came up to them and you just like plopped down on them. You, you, didn't, you didn't check the chair. You didn't look at the chair or anything like that. You just, just plopped down on it. And you're like, you, like, like you thought that chair was going to hold you up. It was an amazing thing to watch you guys do that. Have you ever sat on a chair and had it break? I have. The next time you sit on one of those kind of chairs, do you just sit on it? Oh, no, 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 you do not. How about in school? Do you ever have those, those one kids that um, are like the Philippian jailer and you just wanted to flippy them off, right? And they, and they would pull the chair out from underneath you, right? And you fall down. Now, that wasn't very cool, was it? Next time you go sit down, you grab the chair, right? Make sure it's there. But not, not today, not today. You guys just came in, just plopped yourself down around that chair. It was like you had faith that the chair would hold you. That's what faith is, friends. Faith is not checking to see if God's real. Faith is not wondering if God's going to hold you this time. Faith is not, oh, I didn't hold one time, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not ever going to believe it again. Faith is coming down and seeing God and just plopping down and knowing that he will hold you. Faith is like a chair. Trust the chair to hold you up. Verses 32 through 34. Then they spoke the message of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them out of the jail. Verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night and was washed, and he washed their wounds. That's a servant attitude. There was a lot of wounds to be washed, and they were gross. Right away, he and his family were baptized. Go last week and look at that. This is the common theme. When people want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they get dunked because that has we, that's how we join in Jesus with his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 34, he brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because, because they had kept him from dying. No, rejoiced because he had believed God, and this, I love this part, with his entire household. Here's a man that was so hard and ugly. He had led his family down one road, and he was not afraid to speak to his family about what he had seen. His whole household. Men, Quit being cowards. I'm talking to you men. If you're offended by that right now, I'm okay with that. Stop being cowards. Lead your families right. Stand on the word of God. Teach and train your children. Speak to your coworkers. Show the example of your, lead your household to the Lord. so that your wives and your children 
know that that is the way that is correct. This chapter contains stories of three people who get saved. Now, my thing is, surely there's lots of people who got saved in Paul's time in Philippi, right? We have a whole book written to the Philippians. But why only include three stories? And that is always a question you should ask. We don't have all the stories that were done. So why do we have the stories we have? Every time you come to a story of the Bible, you should wonder, why did God give us that story? That should be the story you ask. Why is it included? I have a couple reasons why I believe these stories were included. One, I believe we have these stories to show us that the gospel is for everyone. Three completely different kinds of people. A rich woman, a religious rich woman, who, who, was, who, who, who had a lot of money, a slave girl, who had no rights of her own at all, and a Philippian jailer, a hardened man. You know, there is no type for becoming a Christian. I have people that are not in Christ all the time tell me, well, I'm just not the Christian type. Well, there's a problem with that. There's only one creator. There's only one father. There's only one God. And we all have one problem. That problem is sin. And we only have one hope. That hope is Jesus Christ and his death as a substitute for in our place. And because of that, the church is the place where the people of vastly different types find a unity in Christ that they wouldn't find anywhere else. We all have characteristics about ourselves that make us feel proud. But the truth of the matter is, there's not just one type that's a Christian. The Lord is for all, for all types. You know, Jewish men would pray every day. And I'm going to read one of the recorded prayers that they would make sure to pray every day. It's from the ancient prayer book of Siddur. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't agree with this prayer they prayed. And the Lord wouldn't agree with this prayer they prayed. But they prayed this prayer every day. Jewish men would. And here's the prayer. Lord, I thank God I am not a woman, a slave, or a Gentile. That's horrible, isn't it? They had no room for women, slaves, or Gentiles in their world. Every morning they pray this. Jewish men felt they were lifted above these kinds of people. Now, I I don't agree with this. But you know who else doesn't agree with this? Evidently God. You know why? Because what did he just save in this chapter? A woman, a slave, and a Gentile. And you know who else he saved? The arrogant religious Hebrew rabbis that prayed these prayers. So, so often we can say, oh, look at you. Look at you. You prayed against these things and God made it happen. And we forget them. God says there is no type. All of you are welcome. I accept all. I don't care if you're the one beating me or the one you're getting beaten. I don't care if the one you're marginalizing me or the ones that's marginalized. I don't care if you're the one standing for things that are true and, 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 and rights or the ones that are going all off the wall some other way. I don't care. I save everyone, God says. The woman, the slave, the Gentile, and those that pray that they aren't those people. All mankind. Poor. Rich. Black. Brown. White. Old. Young. Conservative. Liberal. Religious, irreligious, good families, broken homes. There is no type. Our God is for all. And all of those types have one problem. And that one problem is sin, and sin eternally separates us from God. And so we need one hope and one salvation, and that comes through, his name is 
Jesus. And we must speak with our mouths the name of Jesus. We have got to stop thinking our actions are going to show people to Jesus. Stop it. Do that. But open your mouth. Open your mouth. Why, Mike, you seem to be having a good day today. Why is that? Because God is good in my life. He has blessed my family. He loves me. Well, Mike, it, it seems like you're having a tough day. You're right. My day is tough. I'm having a hard time getting through. But it's by the grace of God that he's given me the strength today because he is my substance. And people need to hear the words, church, because they're grabbing for everything and we see it in our society as a let it happen and we can't any longer. I, I don't know what you, what, who you are or what you've done. I don't know if you believe in Jesus or on Jesus or anything in Jesus, but I believe that you can be saved. There's no difference. We have the same Lord who is rich in mercy to all who call upon his name. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, and say it with me, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he comes to us to show us that the gospel is for everyone. He also comes to us to give us give glimpses of, of different people in our city and show us how to reach them. Lydia is one of the people in the city that we have. Lydia, the spiritually interested. We have those people in our town, right? She thinks of herself as somewhat religious, not the same religion maybe as us, don't have the same values as we do. But how do you engage someone that has a religious desire, a religious slant? Well, Paul engages her with spiritual conversation. He talks about Jesus. Paul opens the Bible with her. Seems like a noble way to do this. There are a lot of people in our community who fit this profile, especially in rural communities. They have some sort of religious idea, but they're just not sold out for Jesus. Some have a Christian background, some don't. Some, sometimes spiritual people, they even have, from other religions. I don't care what religion they're from. Sometimes they're active in church. A lot of times they're not active in church. But for whatever reason, they're opening, they're open to having a spiritual conversation. So what should we do, church? We should have spiritual conversations. We should open the word with them. The best way to reach them is expose them to the Bible. How do you do that? Well, these kind of people, you can invite them to church. They might come. Easter's coming up. We're going to have some cards for you in the next couple of weeks to give out to friends, invite to church, invite them to church. Invite them to read the Bible with you. If you're not sure how to do that, talk with me. I'll, do, I'll, I'll spend 15 minutes with you. You'll be good, I promise. And we can do that. Invite them to a Bible study, our men's study, our women's study, are great ways to invite them in to get into the word of God in smaller groups. I love the phrase in Lydia's conversion, the Lord opened her heart. You know what that does for you and me? It takes the pressure off of us. God is the one who does the convincing. My word is to open my mouth. My job is to, is to bring his word. A friend of mine says that um, someone effective in evangelism only has to believe two things, okay? Okay. Here's, if you want to be effective in evangelism, here's the two things you need to believe. I've thought about this for many years. I really like it. He said this. First thing you think, remember, is salvation belongs to God and that faith comes from hearing. If you want to be effective in salvation, in, in, in evangelism, you remember that salvation is God's job. Faith comes from hearing. So speaking is your job. And if you do those two things, you're going to be effective. That's how we reach person number one. The person who is, who, who has a religious, uh, who is, who is, what's the word I say? Religiously, spiritually interested. But here's the problem. For most people in our, in most churches, evangelism stops right there. But there are two kinds of other people. And they won't be reached by inviting them to church. The next one is the slave girl. She will never set foot in a church. She doesn't feel welcome. She doesn't want to go there. And she has shame. Some sort of demon she's working with that she will not let her go. As a matter of fact, the other person that won't show up in church ever is the Roman soldier. See, physically, the, 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 the slave girl won't. The Roman soldier won't because he's cynical and has no interest in religion. And every year, there's just more and more people who just aren't going to church. In a recent study of Great, Great Britain, of the British it says 70%, 70 
of the British people say they have no intention of ever attending a church service again. 70%. For any reason, they don't desire to go to a church service for Easter, for Christmas. They're not even the CEO Christians. That's the Christmas, Easter only Christians, right? Um, They're not even those. They want to go for those things. Not for marriages, not for funerals, not for Christmas Eve services, right? They won't go to, they won't go to church at all. What that means is this, church, a new style of worship will not reach those people. Great first impressions, not going to reach them. Churches that meet in cool venues will not reach them. A vast majority of unchurched and de-churched people will never turn to church, even if faced with difficult personal circumstances. It used to be when you had a hard time in life, you turned to the church. Not anymore. Not even for national tragedies will they turn to the church. It means reaching people, we must do that apart from events and meetings. And you're like, well, that's the Brits, right? Okay, that's the Brits. I'm forget Brits, right? But Great Britain is just a few years ahead of us over and over again in secularization. You watch them and you see what comes down the pipe. Easter and Christmas services, they still work for us. But where Great Britain is, is clearly where we are headed unless we change something. Because each year... The pie of people in our communities who will come to church for special events is just shrinking, isn't it? So if we don't learn how to carry the gospel outside of church, we will lose that whole group. Another way to say that, are you okay with all those people going to hell? Are you okay with that, Christian? That's the question. I'm concerned that we're going to see in the future a lot of flashy mega churches fighting over a larger piece of, of a shrinking pie of just bored Christians. It's one of the reasons why I pulled away from bigger communities and moved to the rural communities. That we have to revitalize what church is. But you know, each year, the number of people when asked you for a real, religious affiliation on the census it is a gross amount of increase the number of people who check none in America. So how are we going to get these two groups in our society engaged in the gospel? Just like Paul did. We have to get involved in their life. When they're not coming to the church, where are they meeting? Where is their watering hole? We're not reaching people by having better music or because Mike tells some funny stories. We're going to get there by being in the prisons. We're going to get there by being inside the community. We're going to be there by being among those in poverty. We're going to be there by being in the pregnancy clinics. We're going to be there by being in the world and not just going through and like, oh, I'm helping out. I'm part of this committee and that committee. Look, the God's letting somebody in there. Open your mouth and talk about Jesus because the world needs to hear. If they won't come to us, we have to go to him, go to them. The other person there is the jailer, the Philippian jailer. That's the skeptic. Boy, I have a whole list of these people in my life. How about you? The guy got saved because of two things. Why did, why did the Philippian JR get saved? Because he inflicted a lot of pain on Paul and Silas, and he watched their reaction to the pain. And then he was a recipient of their grace. Whoa, that's not the American way. We get even. We hold grudges. Somebody hurts me or my family. We have to tear them apart. That's not the Christian way. When they're inflicting pain, you praise your Father. When they're inflicting pain, you speak the name of Jesus. You worship our God. And then when their world's falling apart, you step in and show them the grace that God showed you. Paul was well recognized that God had appointed the suffering in his life to reach the janitor, the jailer, which is why he didn't run. Instead, he chose to do two things in the midst of it. He kept praising God and he extended God's grace to him. What if in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our loss, in the midst of our injustice, our first thought was not, God, what did I do wrong? Or God, 
Who, whose life are you trying to use me? In? Or God, what are you, why are you doing this in my life? But instead, what if our thought was, God, who here needs to hear about the gospel? How, how can I show your love even by what I'm going through? Here's a wild thought. Maybe we should quit asking God to take away this week when we asked him in prayer to give us last week. What do I mean by that? God, use me with my friends. And then hard times come in our life where we can show the true love of God and we're like, God, what are you doing here? Do you hate me? God's like, no, I'm answering your prayer. I'm giving you the most believable opportunity to share the gospel. Some of us, when we suffer, are like, God, what have I done wrong? Or God, where are you? But that's not how we should, we should respond as Christians. An old guy, I can't remember his name, but he said this. I wish I could remember his name, but he said it years ago. I was in college, and he came and spoke. But here's what he said. Two things about your pain. You should see it coming, and you should see it through. See it coming. Don't be surprised by it. You know why? Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. If the world hates you first, remember, it hated me first, Jesus says. God told Paul, I appoint you, I appoint, I appoint you to make my name famous among the Gentiles. And part of that making you famous, he says, I'm going to bring suffering on your life. Psalm 112 verse 7 says, he will not fear bad news. His heart is confident, trusting in the Lord. Does that describe you? I'm not afraid of bad news because I'm confident. I trust in God. We need to see it coming. And we need to see it through. And he will see you through. If you know God has appointed you to overcome the world, and the way that he does that is not just by delivering you from adversity, but many times God delivers you in adversity so you can show others you have hope that goes beyond this world, you can see it through. You can pay, make the choice to, choice to never stop ceasing, ceasing to praise God. You've got, you've got to choose. Because the truth of the matter is, I don't think Paul and Silas felt like praising God that night. But they did. Did you know how we worship puts on display our belief in the promises of God? Now, I know we're not all the same personality. You're like, oh, man, you're going to get all crazy on worship with me here, Mike. I've heard some of you at, at sporting events. <laughs> Let me tell you something about a sports player. They're never going to be by your side during a trial, say, when you walk to the fire, I'll be there with you. Let me tell you something about a sports player or, or celebrity. They will never say the waters that come upon you will never overcome you because I am with you. Maybe you feel, feel weird worshiping with joy. Good, I did too. So how do you start worshiping with joy? Get ready to get uncomfortable. First of all, sing. Sing. I don't have a good voice. I don't care. Sing. Sing loud. Sing proud. Second thing, put a smile on your face when you sing. Don't be grumpy about having to stand and sing with your wife. It's okay, man. Stand up. Put a smile on your wife. Next thing, clap. Okay, clap. You don't have to be on beat. I don't care about on beat. Okay, I don't care about that. Just clap, clap, okay? And, and you know, a, as you stand up and you sing and you smile and you clap a little bit, you know what happened? Every once in a while, you'll start throwing God a Frisbee. It'll be nice. You'll throw God a Frisbee. It'll be easy. And then every once in a while, you'll, you'll start carrying the TV with God. It'll be good. You can carry the TV with God. We start washing heaven's windows. Or give hot God a high five. I don't care what you do. Figure it out. But step outside yourself because our worship puts on display our promises of God. And when you worship God together, what happens is it breaks down. It breaks down all those things like, I'm going to look stupid. I'm going to say something stupid. I'm going to do something wrong. It breaks down that stuff. And what happens is you step into the world, you're like, I have a confidence. Because you know what? The gospel of Jesus Christ sounds like nonsense to the world, but it is the power that saves. Pain and unfortunate circumstances are your chance to put the hope and joy in God. In pain and, 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 and unfortunate circumstances are your chance to put your hope and joy in God and to put it on display. 
Pain and tragedy are your best opportunities to witness. How about we resolve? Here's another thing. It was some, I don't have the quote. I don't know who said it again. I wrote down probably 20 years ago. How about we resolve that in the worst of the worst, that the best of the best is going to come out so that our world can see the greatest of the greatest? How about we resolve that in the worst of the worst of my life, that the best of the best is going to come out so the world can see the greatest of the greatest, and that is our Savior Jesus. Some of you are in prison right now, and you're in the prison of a hard marriage. You're in the prisons of a, of a tough job situation. You, you, you are overcome by chronic health problems. You are the victim of injustice. Your life, just it, just it just feels like it's falling apart around you. And every time you turn, it just gets harder. And I'm not telling you not to do what you can do to remedy that, because here in the next few verses, Paul actually protests what he had to go through. But what I'm saying is, as you go through it, never lose the joy of, your possess, of the possession of Christ. Never lose the joy of Christ. You know why? Because the prisoners are watching. Nebraska and Kansas looks like a big spot, doesn't it? Remember that map we saw at the beginning? I, I, I love Nebraska and Kansas and that spot right there. That spot right there has got a special place in my heart. It's a 30 mile radius around Superior, Nebraska. That's my why. I, I want the gospel to reach. What, what would happen if the gospel reached this 30 mile radius like it did the Roman Empire? 50%. You know, there'd be 3,000 people surrendered and wholly following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Would that make a difference, church? 3,000 people. Do, do not shake your fist at the God of small moves. Do not shake the fist at the, at the changing the one heart. This is my why. I want the gospel to, to spread in Knuckles County and, and beyond 30-mile radius. And I, I want you to talk about the goodness of God. I want to bubble up inside you. I want you to talk about it. I can't do this alone, nor should I even try. But we as an army, is there, is there 11 people in here? Oh, there's more. But we as, we as gospel presenters of, of disciples of Jesus Christ should declare the gospel, should declare the goodness of Jesus Christ, declare the name of Jesus. We should sing about the name of Jesus. When our life is falling apart, we should lift up our praise to our God and pray and sing. We should put a smile on our face when we're doing it. Why? Because the prisoners are watching. You can give me all sorts of broke up right now. Because with any message that speaks to Pastor Mike's heart or where I land, this is it. There is a world out there that we ignore because we're afraid. And there are people that we let close enough to our family to watch our kids. And we can trust them with our children and we can trust them with our secrets, but we cannot trust them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are people out there that dislike you and hate you and are going to say all sorts of evil about you. And they know you're a Christian. They're testing you. They're watching. They're listening. We have a God who saves. And he took that message and he placed it on us sent us out. We must declare his name everywhere we go, regardless of your circumstances. Why? Because the prisoners are listening. Let's pray. Father God, 
I was once one of them. I was once one of the prisoners. Caught in the arrogance and expectation of my own life. Thinking that all I needed was already was inside of me. And I just need to try harder. God, I've been a prisoner in my life. I've been a prisoner who's been caught in the depths of depression. In darkness, feeling suffocating. I've been the prisoner of serving the wrong master. I've been the prisoner of injustice spoken about me and to me. I've been the the prisoner of spreading the very hate that you came to eradicate. But your grace... You didn't give up on me, Father. You haven't given up on us. God, please allow us not to look at our circumstances as as what's coming against us, but allow us to look at our circumstances as an opportunity to praise you that the prisoners would listen. When we see a glimpse of freedom, help us not run to it thinking we deserve, but to stop and pause to see who you might bring to that freedom with us. Maybe even those who have kept us in captivity. May we not fear your love and justice. And may we live in joy and worship you loudly and proudly everywhere we go. Because our God saves. Our God saves. We love you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen.